I'm Paul Walbeck, Dean of the George Washington University Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. Today I'm talking with Adelina Vuchkova Kostal, an Associate Professor of Chemistry and Co-Director of GW's Environmental Green Chemistry Graduate Program. Dr. Vuchkova Kostal is currently collaborating with her colleague, Assistant Professor of Chemistry Jakob Kostal, on a $300,000 National Science Foundation research project to devise an environmentally safe process for converting wood into chemicals. Welcome, Dr. Vuchkova Kostal. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. So tell me about green chemistry. What is it? Sure, I'd be happy to. For many years, we've been living in a world full of chemicals. We may not realize that everything that we touch is a chemical, but everything from the sofa, the chair, uh, to the toothpaste you use in the morning is made by chemists in an industrial setting. And for many years, the criteria for how we make chemicals has been making them functional, making sure that they, they fulfill uh, their role that's intended, and making them efficiently and in a cost-effective manner. And while that has led to tremendous economic progress and certainly uh, is responsible for the quality of life that we enjoy today, we haven't directly thought about the environmental impact of many of these chemical processes until fairly recently. And by that, I'm, I'm referring to the last three or four decades where uh, as a society, we have come to realize the impact uh, of chemical processes is quite significant and has contributed to everything from climate change to many of the ailments um, that we have in our society today and, and diseases. And so green chemistry really came as a realization of, of this fact uh, and chemists agreeing that the only way we can sustainably continue to enjoy the quality of life that we have today uh, is to change the way that we make chemicals, both from the way that we synthesize them in labs and in factories, and also in the way that we identify how a functional chemical is selected. So not only one that has intended function, but also one that is safe for us as consumers, for our planet, for other animals we share the planet with, um, and also for our grandchildren to make sure that it's not going to be around for thousands of years, um, and this has been something that has come to the forefront, I think, increasingly in the past few years. And we're excited that society has uh, come to this realization, and more young scientists uh, have opted to pursue careers in this field, not just green chemistry, but green engineering and other sustainability-related sciences. And so I think we're at an exciting juncture where we see a lot of great science um, that has already started to contribute to us changing the way that chemical industry impacts the environment and our health, uh, but also where we see the challenges that lay before us. Um, and we need to recruit young talent that is able to help get us to that next stage where uh, we can re reduce significantly our reliance on fossil fuels and change the way that we make chemicals um, so that they're safe for us in the environment. So one of the topics that I see in the news frequently is about microplastics. Yes. So is that something that green chemistry would be able to help us solve the, the microplastics in our environment, in the oceans, and everything around us? That is a great example, and I'll tell you why. Plastics are derived from petrochemicals. We don't often think about them that way but uh, they're co-products from some of the fossil fuel that we use to make you know, fuels and other commodities. And so when chemists initially understood and, and uh, developed the processes that lead to plastic formation, they were thinking about function and they were thinking about cost. Um, and they were not as concerned about the longevity of these materials in the environment. And microplastics are basically just much smaller particles of plastic that are found in everything from makeup um, to other personal care products uh, and uh, to other commodities. And so, you know, this is a great example where if we think about the longevity of the commodity and design a new type of plastic that is biodegradable or chemically degradable in a factory, we have an opportunity to fulfill the same function uh, that microplastics and, and macroplastics 
have in our society, but potentially in a way that allows uh, us to reuse these resources to make new commodities. And so green chemistry, I think, is, is very well poised and there are excellent minds working on, on this problem. Uh, but I just want to highlight that the two aspects, both fixing the current situation and trying to remove and extract microplastics from our current environment, but then ensuring that we're not continuing to propagate that type of practice in the future and changing the way that we make plastics and the types of materials that we make to ensure they don't end up in our waterways and making islands of plastic in the ocean. So I'm thrilled to hear that there are next generation of scientists who are studying how to generate products while doing so in a safe and environmentally friendly manner. Are there other innovations underway beyond microplastics? Absolutely. And it, it depends which fields um, we look at. But I would say across the board, both in the process side of things of how chemicals are made. So I'll, I'll use the biomass as one example. Biomass is just any biological material. But you know, when chemists think about uh, some biomass that is useful for fuels and chemicals, they're usually referring to plants and non-edible plants, to be more specific, because we would like to not compete with food resources. And so when you look at non-edible uh, biomass, such as trees, you see a potential source of both fuels and chemicals. Unfortunately, nature makes these complex macromolecules uh, very difficult to take apart and to make into their constituent molecules that would then serve um, as chemicals for either commodities or fuels. And so one of the projects that uh, we have ongoing uh, in my lab, in, in collaboration with the Costal Group, is trying to develop sustainable processes for being able to take tree biomass um, and convert it to useful chemicals. And, and a lot of, of those uh, chemicals have much higher value. So there is an economic argument uh, to be made for such a process. But you know, there are also a way that we can move away from uh, fossil fuels in, in our reliance for chemicals and fuels. But there are so many other examples, Paul, that I, I would not be able um, to, to give you even a small slither of uh, how both industry and academia have taken on these challenges. Uh, and I think as, as much as um, you know, we can look back at the last 30 years or so of green chemistry, green chemistry was started in the early 1990s uh, by uh, two scientists, one at the EPA and, and one in Kodak, Paul Anastas uh, and John Warner. And they you know, basically identified what are the main criteria that we would need to call a process sustainable or green. Um, and this has been a, a guiding light for the, the past three decades. And so under that umbrella, academia has made tremendous progress in catalytic processes that allow uh, you know, cleaner synthesis of chemicals and fuels uh, in processes that use less energy. So they're, they're much uh, more energy intensive in, in the way that uh, they produce chemicals and fuels, and also to a lesser extent in the way that we can make safer or less environmentally hazardous chemicals as well. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited that the field has moved at such a fast pace, and I think what we hope for is that one day there will be no green chemistry, there will just be chemistry. And we will all use these kinds of principles in the way that we synthesize everything from pharmaceuticals to petroleum uh, and petroleum free substitutes of products. So um, I think we're, we have an exciting trajectory for the next decade or two to look forward to an innovation. So you mentioned how these scientists who are on the frontiers of green chemistry defined it. So how, how did they define green chemistry? Well, to be honest, it's, it's, uh, you know, this is something that, that now has stood the test of time. We can look back and say that some of the caveats that they identified are very common sense. For example, to make chemical processes that produce minimal quantities of waste to make chemical processes that, that use minimal energy, that use catalytic processes as opposed to ones that uh, use large quantities of chemicals, uh, and to make them produce safe chemicals and uh, in, in lieu of chemicals that are toxic. So uh, these are very common sense caveats, but I think they have identified some of the key features that we have to be aware of as uh, we go about making chemicals in our labs and also 
uh, looking at chemical processes in industry on both the small and large scale. And they have been very useful. I'll mention that one of the developments in the recent years has been the concept of a circular economy that you might have uh, read about in the news, which is really just looking at nature and the way nature circles chemicals uh, in, in its uh, own processes and applying that to the way we can potentially use the same ideology to make chemicals and remake them into something that's functional at their end of life. And I think that's, that's a, an exciting addition or extension of the way that they define green chemistry um, in that we now look um, at opportunities to do that, for example, at plastic materials where we can chemically recycle and remake functional materials many, many times over. And that's not the same as just the physical recycling, which is often done with your PET plastic bottles, where they can only be reused once or twice. And so we're looking for opportunities like this uh, where we can implement a circular economy of chemicals and we can start to rely on resources that are not a one-time use and refuse. <laughs> So you mentioned using chemicals in, in the lab. That makes me think in part about training the next generation of scientists in your labs and in the classroom. So how has this affected the way that we train and prepare the next generation of chemists? Well, I, I hope that the students graduating from uh, our program, both the master's and, and PhD students, will think about these issues every time they approach a new chemical process. And so through some of the coursework and through the way that we generate new ideas in the lab and identify chemical processes worth pursuing and developing, uh, hopefully will instill this uh, way of thinking about developing new chemistry. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to, to say one of our recent graduates was just offered a position in Dow, uh, you know, which is a, a great chemical company that has made significant progress in green chemistry and innovation uh, in the past decades. And I hope that other examples of students going not just into academia, but into industry and using these skills uh, will help propagate this type of thinking. Uh, and I'm quite confident that it will. We have a lot of talented students passing through our ranks. So the, your comment about the uh, future job of, of the student makes me think about the partnership between academia and industry here. Is this an area where both industry and what researchers at universities are doing are really sort of synced up and pursuing similar goals? You're, you're absolutely right, they are. And I think we see industry-academia partnerships uh, happening to a great extent, for example, in Europe. I think in, in the U.S. we're still aspiring to find more opportunities to do this, but uh, the National Science Foundation and other funding agencies are looking for new opportunities to allow the sort of partnerships and will hope to take advantage of them. Uh, and I think these will be key to actually getting new research uh, out to the market because we'll have to think both about the practical implications and the cost of these new processes, as well as the fundamental science uh, that we're pursuing in developing them. And, and I think that's exciting for students to see something that they've developed in the lab taken to a large scale and used in industry, I think gives great satisfaction and for the faculty absolutely as well. So we, we hope that this model um, will, will propagate in the future and, and we'll be able to commercialize some of the technology that we've developed and, and other colleagues as well. It's great to hear about your research. I'm curious about uh, the next stages in green chemistry. You've started by talking some about its development in the early 90s to where it is now. Uh, what's necessary to move it to the next phase? No, that, that's a great question. I think we need bright young minds who are willing uh, to get into the social, both the social sciences and understand the implications uh, on the environmental and socioeconomic side, but also in the STEM fields and especially in chemistry. Of course, I'm partial to chemistry, but I can tell you that chemists make uh, differences in, in all aspects of life and sustainability is one opportunity that we have um, to truly be part of the solution. And I hope that young chemists and scientists thinking about careers that can make an impact in sustainability will consider 
getting involved uh, in chemistry research uh, at your institution or at the graduate level at GW and, and other places, and also understanding how you can communicate your science to both policymakers uh, and to the general public. And so I think that that's as critical as doing great science. And uh, we hope to see many more participants in our green chemistry and environmental chemistry master's program, uh, but also generally in the sciences and in chemistry. Uh, and and you know, to your point about what else we need, we need awareness from society that we should demand solutions that are less environmentally impactful. We should demand to move away from fossil fuels because we can. And I think we have technology that can be used to propagate us in that field. Uh, we should demand products that are safe and we should educate ourselves as best we can about the environmental cost of everything that we buy. You know, we're, we're used to looking at the price tag, but we're not used to thinking about the resources that it takes for a toy to be manufactured or for a food product uh, and what happens to it at the end of life. And so I think consumer awareness and bright minds uh, coming to, to the, the chemistry field and sustainability uh, will be our path forward. And I, I hope to be alive, to, to see some of that come to, to fruition in, in future years. Well, thank you so much for <laughs> taking the time to talk with us today, Dr. Fuchkova Kostal. It is great to hear about the innovations that you're working on in the lab. It's great to hear about the work that you're doing with students to train the next generation as well. So thank you for spending the time with us today. Thank you so much. And a small drop in the ocean, but we're happy to be part of it. Thank, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you.